Thank you guys for coming. Can you hear me back there? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, so like Chris said, I'm here to talk to you about building application security programs in an uncertain landscape. And I'll get into um, more of what that means um, in a little bit. But, um, keep moving. Uh, a little bit about me. I think you guys, like Chris said, know me a little bit. Some of you out there know me. Um, I'm going to, if any of you heckle me, throw this at you. So be careful what you say. You can throw it back, though, if you want to. <laughs> um, I'm a security program manager for Veracode. I have been in the industry for a while. I started out as a pen tester and then moved on to application security management. Um, I was a consultant for a while, so I've helped build up AppSec programs for a number of different verticals in a number of different um, locations. I spent a lot of time on the West Coast and the East Coast and a little bit in Europe, but um, I have also authored uh, security benchmarks for the Center for Internet Security. Um, you can go online and look at uh, maybe SharePoint benchmark if you'd like. I also am an author for the Uninformed Journal, um, which <laughs> um, uh, that, that totally distracted me. <laughs> Uh, Uninformed Journal, if you guys have read it, um, the, my paper under the Uninformed Journal is, I think, in volume five under uh, the name VF. Um, I uh, am currently at Veracode. Okay, so the agenda, what I really want to talk about today is really give you a state of the state of where I think applications are at today, or application security programs are at today. And that encompasses, encompasses a lot of different um, variables we're going to be talking about. Uh, where the state of the enterprise is, where the state of SCL is today, and also what the threat landscape is and how that's affecting um, application security programs today and how we're actually deploying them. And I also want to give a very brief definition of what an application security program is. I think that there's a lot of different ways that we can define it. Um, and the presentation as a whole is meant to help you strategize and deploy any application security program, whether it be SCL focused or training focused um, or anything along those lines. I'm not necessarily going to teach you about what SCL is. I think we all kind of know. It's been out there for a long time. Um, and then I will go over what I like to call t soft tactics and hard tactics. And this is really going to be the strategy for rolling this out. And I'll explain what those are in just a little bit. Um, and also, uh, if you guys would like, Stop me and interrupt me at any time. I don't want to just talk at you. If you have something to say, let me know. Okay. So why, why even talk about this at all? Um, I think that it's, it's hard. The application landscape is, is changing a lot. Security program management is changing a whole lot. Um, we're, we're kind of used to focusing on let's, let's Surprising to me when I come into organizations, large organizations in the Fortune 100, Fortune 10 even, they're not even considering application security at all, which blows my mind. <laughs> these, these are critical infrastructure, they're pharmaceuticals, they're the banking industry, and they focus a lot on the, the, uh, the network layer, and they've got that all figured out, but they're really not solving the application security problem. Um, we can look at... Um, Companies like Microsoft, who have done a great do job developing out SCL, and they're rolling and running with it. There's other companies that are um, taking it on, too. You're looking at some of the um, more companies, I would say, that on the West Coast that are doing this a lot better than on the East Coast, and I can say that having worked on both coasts. Um, so the, the state of the, the, the threat landscape right now, I would say that just in general, we've gone from, from worms to lulls, and I know that you guys um, attended the keynote session this morning, and you know all about anonymous and lull sec and, and motivations now. But we've kind of gone, like, the characteristics of these types of attacks have moved a lot, and our, our, our response to those attacks are changing, too. But they're, they're kind of immature right now, and we're trying to figure out how to address these problems. Um, we used to focus um, on vulnerabilities that were outside of control. So, for instance, you know, we were focusing on vulnerabilities that existed in platforms like Microsoft or Windows operating systems. We're now moving to vulnerabilities that are inside, control, inside our control. That means the attackers are taking a look at um, our software, penetrating it more, and 
it's our job to fix it from the inside out. Um, it's a lot more, a or it was a lot more ap apolitical, and now it's more targeted, it's more hacktivist, people are doing it for a reason, so they're really, really invested in these attacks. Um, it's also, in the past, it was very service-driven. We're focusing more on the services that are being, comp we're compromising services, and now it's way data-driven. I mean, it was data-driven in the past too, but it's especially more data-driven now. Um, you can see that in the reflection of all of the types of data that's being dropped on a regular basis. It's also very targeted. I mean, HB Gary is an example of that. Um, you see that, um, and this goes along with the hacktivism too, that they're doing this for a reason. They're going after these, um, going after these, uh, these uh, attacks in a very targeted way. Okay, so the state of the enterprise, it's changed a lot over the past five or six years. We all know that when we're developing, it's hyper rapid. It's even faster than agile. Sometimes you're writing code and pushing it up to production same day. I see that quite often with little or no um, interaction in between IDE and deployment, which is very change, very frightening too. I also see variants on the different types of methodologies quite frequently. We've got waterfall, agile, and what I like to call ad hoc, where there's nothing at all. Um, there's hybrid models, whatever you want to call them, but they're super fast. We're getting greater demands for security from stakeholders, internal and external, so that means that customers are asking for it more. They want, it, they want their data to be protected from anonymous. They don't want their credit card to drop. Um, uh, there's increasing regulations on our organization due to the response in these attacks too. So we're facing more and more pressure from um, the outside in. Bodies like SEC are really cracking down on financial organizations I've seen quite frequently. Um, the verticals range widely in capabilities, of course. I see technology companies um, and financials being really good at security and really good at investing in the security of their applications. But if you take a step outside of that, you look at pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals, you look at um, retail, you'll see that they're only doing it due to regulation. It's not necessarily an investment on their brand or on their reputation. So the capabilities that they're going to have inside their organization for protecting against attacks are going to be different also. Um, I find that um, technology, and this is why I think the West Coast is better at AppSec than the East Coast, is because a lot of the technology companies exist out there. The financials and pharmaceuticals are out here, and of course, the banking ones are pretty good. They're not quite there yet. Um, the business units also vary, which is kind of interesting. So when you're designing AppSec programs, you can kind of design them um, sometimes broad enough to be able to deploy and distribute out to everyone in the company, but they're sometimes so varied with those varying um, methodologies that I talked about that you have to actually design one of these programs for each individual business unit. And if your business unit is large enough, or if your company is large enough, say you have um, over 100,000 people in your company, it's like you're designing AppSec for different, um, each, is this on still? Okay. each different business unit. It's also like designing, you've got global, you've got US, you've got subsidiaries. They're all different AppSec programs across the board. We're also trying to cover a lot of the known issues, the stuff that we know that's out there. We can't really target every single vulnerability that we know about. There's no way that we can catch all these classified vulnerabilities. So we're going after things like SANS top 25 and OWASP top 10, and we're trying to catch just those. The problem with that is I think you can imagine that we're, anything that's missed outside of those categories is not going to be addressed, and we don't know what kind of problem that's going to be, even if it's low informational or just plain not exploitable right now. Um, that also means that there's no way to be able to predict, predict future threats or predict future problems. So let's say, for instance, um, I think a, like in the, in the late 90s, DOS, DDoS was, you know, a big problem, but in the mid-2000s, it wasn't such a big deal. Now it is again. So, I mean, you really have to pay attention to vulnerabilities and attacks, even if you're not necessarily thinking that they're a priority right now. Okay. Um, this is just a case study of what I think uh, 
uh, a traditional or some of the types of enterprises look like that I've seen. So let's just say that we've got two business units of equal criticality. That means that they're going to both affect brand reputation. If their data gets stolen, um, there'll be heavy fines, that um, their business as a whole will be impacted greatly or non-existent if they get owned. Um, there's two different sides of the house. You've got an application that's got super old code in it. They're old systems. They're proprietary, but they're also using lots of open protocols. Um, there's lots of ad hoc development, which just means that, that there's no checks, there's no QA. It's just being put into production pretty quickly. Um, inflexible management. Management, since they've been around for decades, doesn't really want to hear about what's new, what's fast, and how we can fix it. On the other side, we've got web services, and in this case, we've got something where um, we've got new code, we've got fast code. They're like, they're living in the, the West Coast mentality where they're trying to build stuff really quick. Um, they're somewhat gated, kind of flexible management, but of equal business criticality, what is it that you want to do to get AppSec deployed in this environment? You have to kind of design for each, each one. So th these are the types, I think, of maturities. And I'm not just talking about SPL maturity. I'm talking about overall AppSec maturities in, in different companies. Um, I kind of want to say there's ad hoc program and mature. Ad hoc is where they're doing occasional pen testing, maybe some dynamic and static analysis. Um, they're missing in gaps, education, and no, there's no application portfolio. So you need to know what applications you've got in your enterprise. And that, I think, is one of the biggest problems that we have today. When I see customers saying, I don't know, can you come in and tell me what my AppSec program should be? I say, what do you have? And they say, I have no idea. I don't know what applications I have across the enterprise. Um, AppSec at this point is also opt-in, which means that no one does it. Or if, if they do do it, it's because they are motivated by a breach or some sort of um, external. Um, uh, programs are benchmarked. You kind of know where your environment's at. You've done a quick assessment. You, you've figured out kind of what your applications are. You may not have them all, but you know where they're at from a security perspective. Maybe you've done a rapid assessment um, all, of all of the applications with the static or dynamic analysis. You kind of know, but you don't really know. The problem with the, the program model is that you're not exactly operational, which means it still may be not be mandated. It might be you've got policy going on. Um, you're a little bit educated. If you pop down into a mature application program, this is where it's distributed, it's scalable, everyone can use it, it's repeatable, it makes sense, people are aware of it, it's mandatory, everyone has to do it. Um, depending on what your designed application um, or what your design program looks like. And then the gaps there are really just what you evaluate as you move forward um, with your application security program. So what you kind of uh, assess and say, oh, we're missing, we're missing this part of it. And that's always changing, and that's how you figure out how you're going to keep moving um, with your application security. OK, so when I started building these application security programs, I, you know, I went out to the internet, and I Googled SDL, and I downloaded it, and I was like, wow, this looks really pretty. It looks great. I just really love this, but I don't know what this means. I don't know how this applies to me. I don't know how to deploy this. What does this mean to my company? I don't really know what this is. All the components look great. Can I take some of these and plug them into my application security program? Will people understand what this Chevron graph looks like when I show it to them? I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's a really hard problem to solve. So I just want to cover very briefly um, tiny history of SDL, where it came from. It was a response to some issues that Microsoft was having in the early 2000s. Um, they developed it to respond to a lot of the worms that they were seeing, and it was a great step forward, and I think definitely a pioneering step forward in um, application security programs overall. Um, there are some gaps, though, in groups like OWASP and uh, BSIM um, decided to release some frameworks to wrap around SDL or just co include components of SDL into it. Um, they also release some maturity models, which means that you can to get a better understanding of where your, where your program is at or where your SDL is at, and then grow it towards more capabilities. Um, 
So the types of methodologies that I see today, I see rarely, I rarely see agile, I, mean, I rarely see waterfall. I don't see that anymore. Um, if I'm Microsoft, I might see waterfall methodologies, but I see lots of variations of agile and then hybrid waterfall and agile methodologies as well as the ad hoc. I see a lot of ad hoc, which is really frightening. Okay, so talking about SDL, the problems that I see with SDL, it's a methodology, right? It's not a program, it's not a security program. I can't take it and follow it. There's no steps really to it. There are if you follow it, if you follow the chevrons across, but you still don't really understand how to socialize this. You don't know how to get it into your environment. It has to be customized to each company as a whole. And that's the problem that I have with it. Um, also, you're not Microsoft. You're not operating like Microsoft. You don't have the processes that Microsoft does. This is customized to Microsoft. So it's difficult to do this if you're not Microsoft. Um, it's also very bloated. There's so many activities to do. There's so many things that, that, that enterprises, I think, look at and get analysis paralysis with because they're like, okay, there's 100 million things I have to follow. There's tons of best practices guides. There's checkbox lists across the board. There's activities that all of my developers have to do. They have to train here and there. Um, and there's no way that anyone can, any one company, unless you're Microsoft, or maybe Microsoft can't even do it, but there's no one company outside of Microsoft that I've ever seen that does this. I think that if they can get a couple pieces of those into their programs, they're, they're far more advanced than most people out there. Um, it's also hard to implement those components, pushing them out into uh, enterprises is often very challenging and difficult. Um, it's also heavy handed. A lot of the mandatory parts of it, I think, are not flexible enough for enterprises to be able to use effectively. Um, it's rigid. It's, it's, it's hard to move outside of that process if you've got a weird development life cycle or, or weird um, languages or anything that's not your standard development. So I want to talk a little bit what about, about what an application security program is. I think it's kind of weird uh, bringing that up. You probably have an idea in your mind of what an application security program is. I'm not going to rehash the traditional definition of what it is, but I want to highlight um, that application security programs do not necessarily include SDL sometimes. Um, it can be pieces of it or just what, uh, portions of it or the whole thing within your programs, but application security programs are what I would call a wrapper for SDL. Um, they're strategies, tactics, metrics, um, and things along those lines, and I'll get into exactly what those are later. So the goal, the whole point of doing an application security program is to protect your assets, interests, stakeholders of the enterprise. Those are the things that you care about the most. If you don't have those things, you don't have business. So all of your programs need to be designed with this in mind. And you need to des design your programs with the notion that the enterprise is continuously going to change in uncertain lands, or continues going to change. It's going to be uncertain, and you probably won't be able to control or predict it for the most part. Um, but you have to operate with the tenet that those outside forces are not going to control your results. You have to know that you're in charge of your uh, enterprise, not them. Um, and this is what I really believe that security is all about. This is about protecting the user, protecting um, your enterprise, however you want to do it, that's a successful application security program. It doesn't matter what you're doing or how you're doing it um, or when you're doing it. I think that it's preferable to do it now, but it, as long as you're achieving that desired state, you have a successful program. And I want to illustrate that because I think that people get stuck in what SDL is. Um, and they don't look outside of it, and they're kind of boxing themselves and not being creative about how they could take it farther. So I think that these are some examples of successful application security programs, and you might see some logos on there that you would not consider successful when you think about it. But if you look at um, Goldman Sachs, have you guys ever heard about Goldman Sachs AppSec program? Because it's so good that you don't need to hear about it. <laughs> they're really good. Um, Companies that go from zero to hero, right? If you can take your problems and learn from them and become the poster child for how to do it right, we can call um, Microsoft one of those, 
right? They have done so much for AppSec, whether or not they're um, still producing bugs or not is irrelevant. They've really changed the whole face of AppSec as a whole. Um, Zappos, I want to say Zappos because even though they were compromised not that while, not that long ago, I still believe that they handled that incident with a lot of grace. They did a good job reaching out to their customers. Um, I don't know what their internal, internal processes were. I don't know what they changed internally, but I do think that from an external view, they did a great job. Okay, I want to talk about, oh right, Adobe. <laughs> Adobe, um, Adobe is a good example of how you can significantly change the security posture of your applications in a very short period of time. Um, they, for a long time, were the poster child of serious vulnerabilities. Um, they were, <laughs> they went from very bad to better. They're not great yet, but they're, they're getting there, and that's, that's an indication of a successful application security program. Okay, so tactics. Um, what I want to, when I'm talking about tactics, uh, I'm going to talk about two things, soft tactics and hard tactics. And what this really does is bridge, bridge business and technology or bridge business and security together. Um, you can't have one without the other. We talk a lot about hard tactics a lot when we talk about application security. That would be your pieces of SDL. The soft tactics are what I like to call the art of security, application security, and hard tactics are the science of application security. Um, Hard tactics are more of the how. Um, these are getting getting it done. How do you get SDL in your environment? It's, we're talking about processes, governance, policy, metrics, execution, and performance. These are all very tangible items. When I'm talking about soft tactics, I'm talking about strategy, politics, things that probably we as security people are not the best at and could get a lot better at. Um, structure, culture, fanaticism, and also dedication. So when you're thinking about soft tactics, think of them more as social hacking or how you are interacting with, with the people in your enterprise to get this done. Um, it's not the plan, it's not the pro program, it's not the, the roadmap, it's not any of the tangible items that you can really track, these are the, the intangible. And I really believe that these soft tactics are the most critical out of everything to getting um, application security programs successful and running an organization. So we talk a lot about culture when we talk about SDL and application security. Um, SDL traditionally is developing with security in mind. It's following best practices, checklists, checklists making security a priority in your organizations. It's top-down ex uh, executive um, pushed and uh, prioritized. But we really need to think that it's a lot more than just building security in. We need to think that it's collaborative, not contentious. We all know that there's a big rift between um, security and development. We need to close that gap. We can do that by being um, very positive, pointing out the good things. One of the good things that Veracode is now doing is starting to look at when developers do things right, right? So we're not just pointing out all the flaws, we're actually pointing out what they're doing better. Um, competitive, make it competitive. Pit two dev groups against each other, see what happens. That really works, that really gets them motivated to start going somewhere. Also paranoia, um, we as security people are, are paranoid people. We need to use this as a tool and stop using it as a detriment. Um, and I'll show you what that means in a little bit. But also, it can't just be top down. We gotta do it from bottoms up. So this means um, getting grassroots activated, campaigning at the dev level, and having them socialize it. Um, and it also, I believe, one of the biggest uh, helpers to getting application security programs off the ground is um, having development drive it and actually own it, not security. Um, so paranoia. I want to say that paranoia is a great tactic to use. Um, it's, often, it's not mentioned as a tool very often, but it's great for driving initiatives, predicting events, and identifying gaps in your organization. There's a couple types of paranoia that I, ha I can identify. There's over-paranoid people, there's under paranoid people, and then what I like to call perfect paranoia. Um, I've seen this happen. There's, there's a thing, take it away. I didn't see it, it's not there. So, what I like to call hyper paranoia. Um, we've got over paranoid programs where we're doing too much at one time. We've got 
um, over paranoid resources um, and enter, uh, enterprises. Um, this, I think this, I think actually hyper paranoia has a greater negative effect on security than under paranoia does. I think the reason for that is because it completely can kill an initiative and drive it away. Um, you lose your support, you lose your, your resources, you lose your buy-in. Um, there's a lack of attention on real problems. Problems are. Um, if every problem is a problem, then there's no problems. Um, there's a huge customer impact. If you're over paranoid, they're hearing too much or they're hearing the wrong things, they don't believe you anymore. Um, and some examples of what I like to call a hyper paranoid organization is one that follows the herd all the time. They're buying into the media hype. They're freaking out whenever there's an issue, whether or not it applies to them. They're overreacting completely, hyperextending initiatives, making them too big because they don't know what to target. Um, and also, all threats and all incidents are critical. Um, I have a good case study of this. Um, let's say we have a large organization with critical infrastructure. It's very important, right? Um, security leadership's driving for mass, um, mass enterprise impact. They want the entire organization to adopt now, now, now. So they're driving pretty hard. We don't know what the landscapes are. We don't know um, from an application perspective where we're at. Um, we don't know what the threats are externally because we don't have that knowledge. We don't know what's attacking us or threatening us. So that means that all threats are classified as nuclear bombs. They're all too hard to handle. Um, we are fabricating crisis to gain buy-in, which I think is the boy who's crying wolf, right? These people tend to, tend to not be believed in the future. Um, what happens then is that resources are exhausted, sponsors are exhausted, executives lose attention, there's no buy-in, there's no credibility, we're not executing anymore, no one wants to do anything, and there's a high turnover of resources. And the result of that is that we're unable to implement or execute initiatives. Passively paranoid, this just means that we're not really doing any, anything at all. And that, that's, that's very, very frequent. I see that more than anything where we're kind of spot checking things, we're doing what I call whack-a-mole security. Um, there's, there's little attention or buy-in from, from executives at all. Um, we can't track or monitor trends, we're losing um, knowledge, we don't know what the most relevant threats are, and we're not securing um, our stakeholders. And what happens, what happens when um, we don't, we're not paranoid enough is that we have Cyber Pompeii. <laughs> um, I just want to make one point. Um, Cyber Pompeii was, um, uh, it was born here at, at Source Boston by Dino Daizovi, and uh, there's going to be one other Cyber Pompeii slide um, during Source, <laughs> during Source this time, and it's going to be in Dan Guido's talk. So please go uh, to his talk and tell me whose Cyber Pompeii slide is better. I think that mine is clearly, because I mean, fire and graphics. Okay. All right. So perfectly paranoid. What's perfectly paranoid? Um, this is when you're realistic about the threats and incidents that are occurring. It's very evidence and data-based, so everything that you're doing and acting on has data and numbers to back it up with. We're using paranoia as a tool. Um, we're using it to socialize. We're using it to get initiatives done. Um, and then we're very productive in execution. The good sides to that is that it's very motivating to um, your company or to your enterprise. Um, you're visionary, you're figuring out what's the next thing coming, right? Those unexpected, uncertain events that we're trying to catch, you're more likely to catch them this way. Um, and it also helps improve the techniques and gain buy-in. So fanaticism is also something that's very important, and that means that your whole enterprise is constantly pushing to get better. Um, I think that that so often doesn't happen, where people are like, oh, security, okay, we'll do it. So the stakeholders need to drive towards the corporate goals, and that means putting security in your corporate goals. They have to be realistic and achievable. Don't throw tons of goals onto your dev groups and have them drown in them and have them not be able to achieve them. When you're making them feel bad for not being able to meet an initiative that you set, you're doing it wrong. 
you can't be myopically focused, so don't just focus on your security group. Security has a tendency to uh, buckle down and stay within its own group and not understand the business. You have to know and realize that the business always wins. At the end of the day, if there's no business, security doesn't matter. You have to be very strong in your ramp up. You have to persevere. That ramp up, that initial few six months is most critical to, to, to being successful. And you have to be very high, high performance in, in difficult times. That means don't drown under the weight of an incident. Data, all of this, all of these soft tactics have to be drowning in data. Back by tangible evidence. Um, find out what you're doing wrong now. Get an entire view of your organization right now. If you don't know, why not? Why don't you know? You need to figure that out. You need to know what your problems are. Move management with pretty pictures. They love metrics. They love looking at graphs. Dumb those down. Make them digestible for upper management. You want to start uh, socializing your highlights and lowlights. That means what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and how you're going to get better. And compare all that data to industry trends. Are you seeing the same types of problems um, as a pharmaceutical that uh, the entertainment industry is seeing? Probably not. OK, a couple of things that you want to do and don't do with data. Use it to drive initiatives. Use it to identify what you're doing wrong. Use it, use it to predict and be ahead of the curve. So if you're seeing something that's trending but you haven't quite seen it before, figure out what that is and what that means. Don't overload your stakeholders with reporting or metrics. Don't give them too much that you can't, um, that they can't see what's going on. Break it down by, by layer. Have your management, um, exec management and dev or, or executors down here. Have them all receive different data. Don't always stick to the standard. Um, I know that in security we've done a, a whole lot of identifying what the standard is, but don't stay within that box because if you do, you're going to miss a whole lot and you're going to create a problem for yourself. And of course, don't fail to understand future problems. Okay. Um, in this time of uncertainty, I want to point out that uh, the most urgent decisions are rarely the most important ones. Um, model, you guys go ahead, if you want to, look that up and figure out what types of incidents or um, you should be responding to. This is a great resource, this matrix for categorizing what you should respond to now or later. Um, from an organizational perspective, um, security as a whole tends to operate within a silo. We tend to think that um, we know what's best and we're going to do what we think is best for the organization. Uh, it's too egocentric and that creates a lot of organizational animosity um, and creates um, a lack of understanding of the threats that are out there. Um, things like IP theft go unnoticed. So you really need to reach out to your dev teams and make sure that they're involved in it. In fact, I really think that the dev teams should be the ones driving the application security programs and, and uh, security should be support. Um, you want to gain the confidence of VPs, development, and uh, development managers, and developers. Prove that remediation is easy. There's a big pain point with, oh, I have to fix these bugs. Too hard. Um, prove that it's not a big deal. What's the problem? It's like a two-line fix. Let's do it. Um, create the success stories and push them throughout the organization. Make people heroes. And encourage them to compete for the best posture. So have one business unit uh, do really well and another do not so well. Make someone the villain and hero and see what happens. Um, okay. uh, these are the two different types of uh, um, security uh, in an organization that I see. One is centralized, one is distributed. Um, in the centralized model, you see this is where security is holding everything. They're driving everything. They're pushing everything out to exec. They're pushing it out to dev, vendor, policy, and third party. I know it's kind of hard to read there, but that's what that says. Um, it's very initiative driven, and security is the governing body. In the distributed model, all of the responsibilities 
are outwards towards the whole enterprise as a whole. Everybody's got um, not equal responsibilities, but they've got very important key responsibilities to get it done. Uh, it's very policy and development driven, and security acts more as a support function. Okay, uh, building the right staff. I'm almost running out of time, I think. <laughs> uh, building the right staff is um, definitely uh, important. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out is that yes, buy uh, or get the right kind of staff, but don't necessarily buy rock stars, right? Or don't get rock stars in here. I know that probably there's going to be a lot of people that really <laughs> don't want to hear that. But the point is, is that rock stars tend to have um, an inward focus on themselves. They can be a little bit difficult, like these guys in the front row here, the narcissistic vulnerability pimps. Um, they spend a lot of time on their personal interests, uh, especially that Dino guy. <laughs> All right. A, a couple of things that I want to um, indicate for gaining buy-in. I'm going to flip through these slides pretty quick, but. Um, some points of leverage that you want to use, metrics, mandates, tying to bonus, actually get security tied to your bonus. When it affects somebody's paycheck, they will do it. Um, put, put it in your contract length, um, make it a requirement in mergers and acquisitions. Um, it needs to be gate, uh, exit, and entry cr criteria, and then also work it from the bottom up. Um, so, soft tactic summary, um, build all resources, processes, and tools with the following principles. Make sure that you're not overreaching, you're not overextending, and you're not over in, overdoing initiatives. If you do, you're going to tire your organization. Stay focused on your goals, move them if necessary. If, if your program changes, if your program needs change, then move it. Um, don't follow the herd, don't overreact, and don't leap for alluring opportunities, right? So if you're a CISO, don't buy all the tools. Don't buy all of them. Why the ones that work and the ones that you need. Okay, so hard tactics. Um, hard tactics are really what I would like to call the program model. This is really um, the structure or the how or the process that you'll follow to get it done. Um, the core components that are in the um, hard tactics are strategy, program, and tactics. Um, the strategy is, of course, the objectives, the goals, the organizational tolerance. The program includes communications, policy, government, roles and responsibilities, KPIs and metrics. Tactics are the actual activities that you're performing, so classification, execution, the processes, um, action items, and goals. And these all tie into a process that you can run through continuously in your organization. This isn't a one-time thing, but this works really well, well time around. But you can use this and tie in all of these, execute them all at the same time. I think I see a lot of organizations who spend a lot of time focusing a lot on strategy at first. What should we be doing? How are we going to do this? And then they develop the program, and then they go and execute the tactics. And what that does is really create a lack of what looks like results. So if you can do all of these at once, there's, there's no reason why you can't get results within the first month and use that to push. Okay. In the assessment phase, this is where we're going to stop doing whack-a-mole security. Um, whack-a-mole security is really uh, when you are, <laughs> 10 minutes left, uh, is when you're nitpicking and finding one or two vulnerabilities, fixing them, looking at one application here and there and fixing them. Um, common practices, um, enumerate your enterprise assets, record your inventory, assess the environment all together. Um, from an organizational standpoint, identify your, your stakeholders and how that fits in, um, who's doing, who you're going to leverage when, um, looking at executives, development managers, security managers. Um, enumerate your enterprise assets. Figure out what they are. Enumerate them. Um, it's the hardest task in the world. It could take you years, but hopefully you finally can, can do it sometime and prioritize it. Uh, do a communications push or a marketing plan. Get an SVP plus to, to invest in this and send it out. Um, you want to send out emails, send videos, whatever it takes to get people listening. Um, so in the established phase, we want to start creating that, that foundation of the program as a whole, the design of it. So we're going to take a look at our goals. We're going to establish our goals, figure out what we need to achieve, and tie them back into uh, the organization. If your security goals are not tied back to an organizational goal or an enterprise goal, it's really not important. 
Um, you want to identify and update or identify your critical success factors and your, your SDL integration points and define roles and responsibilities. Um, in defining your goals, you want to do it in waves, right? So um, your goals now may not be the same goals that you have next year, but you want to figure out very quickly what your goals are going to be. Create early wins, right? So get, get examples that will help you um, push in the future. Um, this is an example of how to tie back into your information security program and then tie this back into your organization. Um, create some roadmaps per business unit and clear timelines for what they can find. An example of what a team might follow within a certain number of quarters, the, the descriptions and activities that they want to follow. Um, this is just a racing matrix. They, people need to know who's doing what. If you're integrating this into an SDL, they need to know what is DevOps doing, what is security architecture doing, what are the dev managers doing, um, et cetera. Um, gate, gate your security program. Make sure that there's pieces in there where there's um, checks that they have to follow. Um, we need to check progress process quality. Uh, frequently, we need to realign business need if necessary, and then um, insert into those key areas. And then, of course, act on it, right? Do your security testing, remediate, um, integrate into the SDL, all, use all of the services and tools that you need to do. I would consider this part the quote unquote SDL part. Um, here's an example uh, plan, life cycle plan for a high priority application. You guys, if you want to check the structure after the fact, you can look at the slides. This is an example of what a process might look like, your typical swim lanes, but people should use this to follow um, the execution. And then, of course, governance is always really important. You need to monitor, review, and report on your application security program. And when I say governance, I don't mean uh, application security policy. I mean the governance of your program. How are you monitoring that it is actually uh, working? So some of the things that you want to do is gather metrics on adoption, um, security posture, flaws, what's going on. You, you're reviewing your application security portfolio. You're classifying the trends and informing um, the program. You're prioritizing and looking for areas of improvement in your program. Um, and you're also working on program status reporting. There's a couple different things that you can do for status reporting. There's, of course, your weekly status reports that you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with. But this is at the program level. Um, and you also want to do quarterly business reviews where it's just a gut check of where your program's at and where you can check on your goals and then realign them if necessary. Um, so metrics, of course, are probably one of the most important things that you can take care of. You're measuring your successes and failures. Failures, You're using it um, to um, figure out where those uncertain and unpredictable events may be. If you're, looking, if you're seeing a trend that you didn't really know, you need to investigate that. Um, and you can use it as um, leverage to move the business in a certain direction. There's a few examples um, of metrics that we use. Um, and the Vericoders in the room will, will be familiar with these. But I use these um, at a management level to push out to show what's going on. Here you can just see frequency of testing and the types of testing that we're using. Um, this is just top flaws. This is good success cases. So I can say that this. This team is remediating really well. They're getting rid of bugs really quickly. Um, there's also tons of flaws that you can, this is um, some of flaws, flaws remediated and open flaws. And then you can also look at flaws per line of code or flaws per megabyte. Policy compliance, that's always a good one. Um, people need to know if they're passing or failing. This can also be a gate check. So um, you can break that down by business unit or vendor, which they find very, um, Management finds that as a good tool to figure out who's introducing vulnerab more vulnerabilities into the environment. OK, and then the last phase is just going through and just program and making sure it's going right. So here you want to do those yearly reviews, uh, quarterly business reviews, portfolio analysis, and then a posture, um, uh, pro posture planning. All right, so as a whole, sorry I rushed through the last part of it, but you guys can probably check it afterwards. But um, the summary of this talk in general is really just to identify the changing enterprise environment, 
um, in the uncertain threat landscape. Uh, also, to take a check or snapshot of the existing methodologies and identify whether or not they're cumbersome or challenging to your specific environment, I'm guessing that they probably are. And then, of course, create a strategy for, for successful programs that must include both the soft tactics and the hard tactics, um, where soft tactics are the art of application security and hard tactics are uh, the science. Any questions? I know there's no time left. Yes? <laughs> I won't hire narcissistic vulnerability pimps. <laughs> Adrian, any questions? <laughs> He was going to heckle me. Yes. Yeah. I've never seen you do this. <laughs> um, I think that you the way that you inform your executive or management team um, and the types of interactions that you have with them um, and them being able to see a level of calmness and um, understanding of the, the environment overall, the threat, and how is how you're going to be perfectly paranoid. Your management team and your, your board of directors Yes, Adrian. Yeah, no, I do think that they are, I agree with you, um, but I don't think they were on, the scale is different, I would say, because they're so targeted now, I don't, and, and they're so expensive now, and what they're being used for is different. I think that the threats that we're starting to see that are the most impactful, probably, are the ones that we're introducing. But I mean, yeah, you're right, they, I mean, I don't know, comment? I mean, I, I see, I've seen targeted attacks, but 99% of the time they're not going to be. I mean, I mean, I've seen those, those APT type attacks, but it's not usually, in my experience. Yeah, I actually have uh, companies that I work with where the development team has identified that there's a need for security. So they're the ones that are coming to the enterprise and saying we need to do it. I would say that it's the drivers for that are either incident, right, or um, requirement or uh, customer asks. So they don't, I mean, development doesn't really want to do it if they don't have to, but um, it really re requires education on their part, but give them the responsibilities and have security be the support. I think we're at, at zero time. Thank you.